for some, like myself, the Kundalini Awakening process can really, really suck. Today, I want to be a little vulnerable and open with you and talk about some of the darkness that I've experienced on my path. I think at this point in the series, we're about 30, 40 episodes deep. I haven't really disclosed too much about my own self, my own process. I wanted to put out information about Kundalini Awakening that wasn't so centered around me. I wanted it to be a bit more general. But today, I think we've built up enough trust, you being my audience, that I can divulge a little bit about some of the, the difficulty that I've faced. Now, the reason I'm sharing this is primarily to show you that, you know, you're not alone if you happen to be going through some difficulty. Uh, it seems to be for some people just the way that God likes to wake up within us in a, in a very challenging and, and difficult way. It's how we get initiated to these more advanced states of consciousness, you could say. So I want to keep you company and let you know you're not alone. I want to let you know that, you know, I've, I've been through difficult stuff myself so I can relate. I do understand how difficult it is. And I also want to exercise a little bit of compassion and appreciation for myself, reflecting back on what I've been through. Admittedly, you know, once you come through this process and you're kind of in a stable place, things get a little strange because, you know, you're, you're very grounded in the present moment past, future, they kind of become these very weird sort of abstract ideas. And if you look back into the past, you can have a bit of amnesia about, you know, what you really went through and what happened. The way when I look back at the past, it's kind of like, you know, somebody else's story or life because I've died and been reborn through these processes so many times, these healing cycles, and each of those deaths was, was painful. So now when I look back, it's like there's a sense of dissociation with, with the story of, of who I was back then. And so today I want to honor that, that part of me and, and share openly with you um, because it is part of, of, you know, this this human here, Brent. It is his story and his journey. And so even though I may not be identified with it and I may have, you know, for the most part gotten over it, I still want to honor it and, and be open with you. So I'll just jump right into it here. Um, I want to focus really on the darkness here. So it's not going to be, you know, my full awakening journey per se. But it's just going to talk about some of the darkness that I've felt. I'm going to try and provide some context around that. And, and in, in between, you know, what I'm sharing, I'll try and give some some insights about how I got through it and, and kind of my attitudes and, and uh, you know, the solutions that I found along the way. So how the spiritual journey began for me was about... 14 or so it's when I kind of began to start to question the uh, religion that I was brought up in which was Catholicism start to ask you know the, the questions you know if there's a loving God why does he send people to hell and you know is everybody else who doesn't you know believe in Jesus Christ are they going to go to hell you know just because they didn't happen to you know ever um, you know come across Jesus or you know the, the teachings of Jesus Christ or whatever you know I ask these basic questions you know if I was born you know maybe I was born in Tibet I would be a Buddhist so you know, religion was arbitrary, this thing that kind of just uh, was puzzling to me. Eventually, I, I recognized, you know, I, I, it's no longer serving me, and I moved towards atheism. And I remember reading Richard Dawkins' book, The God Delusion, and that was like some atheist material. And I remember closing the book, and when I closed the book, I said, all right, I read the book, you know, I can now call myself an atheist. And it was from that point that I had, you know, abandoned any sense of religion and no sense of, like, you know, spirituality, like, um, outside of organized religion. I had no sense of any of that. And so I'd cut off any connection with the higher power, any sort of sense of purpose, higher purpose, any sense of meaning was all kind of taken away from me. Um, even a sort of, like, a, like a, a moral compass, I had nothing. I was just, like, you know just completely uh, isolated in terms of my beliefs or lack thereof. And this set me up for, for what was to come. So in high school, I have, you know, my first fling and I'm, I'm you know, experiencing like puppy love and um, on top of the world. And I get a message on MSN one, you know, Friday night or something. And somebody says, hey, you know, I saw the girl that you were supposed to be with or whatever. I saw her kissing someone else. And when I, you know, got this message, I experienced the beginning of a descent into like a really, really dark place. So I'm about 15 at the time. And, you know, like I said, no connection with any higher power, not no no support system in terms of spirituality per se, you know, practices, nothing. I was an innocent child. 
and I'm experiencing like heartache, jealousy, betrayal, embarrassment, insecurity, uh, to a degree that I never thought was even possible. You know, I didn't know it was possible to even experience dark emotions to this degree, you know, in my innocence as a child. And this was very, very uncomfortable for me. And around this time, I began to think, you know, if there's no religion or God or spirituality, none of that is real. And what's the point of any of this? And then I recognized, you know, we're all chasing something in the future. Either we want to, you know, get a house and then we want to pay off the mortgage and then we'll be happy. And then we want to retire and then we'll be happy. Or then we want to get a, you know, get a boat or a cottage and then we'll be happy. Or if we're sick, we want to get healed and then we'll be happy. It was an ongoing thing about the future. Everyone was hoping to get well in the future, or be happy in the future, or be fulfilled in the future. And this realization, you know, dawned on me and I realized, you know, nobody's made it. Nobody's happy. Everybody's chasing. We're like, you know, running on a, on a hamster wheel here. So I thought, okay, how about uh, celebrities? You know, they've got everything. But even they're not happy because, you know, we look and we see scandals and they're, you know, using drugs and they're addicts. Not all of them, but some of them are addicts. And, you know, they can't leave their house because the paparazzi bothers them. And there's rumors about them. And so even they're not happy. And I thought, you know, nobody's happy. This is absolutely horrifying and terrifying. And life felt like, you know, it was a really, really... Um, you know, meaningless. And this combined with, you know, this heartache that I was going through was, was put me in a very, very deep, deep depression. Now, at the time I couldn't, uh, you know, call it depression. I didn't know what depression was. I just felt sad. And I felt like my just my sadness was justified based on, you know, what I was experiencing and the way I was viewing the world. And so there came points where I wanted to, like, you know, end my own life. And it was suicidal, of course, and, and it was genuine depression. But to me, it felt rational and justified, you know, like, it's not like I have to heal myself of depression or uh, feeling suicidal, there was no way out, because this is just, if you, if everyone else would wake up, they would feel the same way as me. If they would wake up out of, you know, the, the, and see that we're all just chasing fulfillment in the future. So anyway, this set me up for the spiritual journey. And, you know, there, there's much more like difficult darkness around there. I'm, I'm feeling like, you know, I can be a little open and, and talk about some things that are kind of shameful and embarrassing with you and so you know th that that girl that you know that I really had a lot of feelings for um I opened up about what I was dealing with just one friend and and I really poured my out heart out to him you know what how I was feeling and 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 he was there for me and around this time you know I would have to go to school and I would see you know these these people in my school and everybody knew and um, I had to pretend like I was okay being a man being a boy a young man um, I didn't feel, you know, like it was safe to be emotional and vulnerable and, and I didn't know who to turn to. There were people I could have turned to, you know, friends, family, but I didn't feel comfortable with that. I just turned to this one friend and, you know, I can laugh about it now. He's actually a good friend of mine now, but, um, one day I see him and the girl and they're together and he says, Hey man, I, you know, it just kind of happened. And, you know, that really, really was, was brutal. It was just, it's like it really devastating to me. And, um, this made me ripe for spiritual development, for spiritual awakening to take place. You know, I've spoken with countless people on the spiritual journey, and I haven't come across even one person that came into the genuine path without you know, being, being made ready through difficulty. And so around this time, somebody had sent me a message. They sent me uh, the power of now on Facebook, some random person. It was back when random people could add you, and it wasn't super creepy. And so he sends me the power of now. He says, hey, read this book. I have no idea why, but I was compelled to begin reading it. And I just began to crush this book. And it was speaking to me. It was, it was the power of now by Eckhart Tolle. And he writes about how, you know, being in the now is where real peace and fulfillment and happiness is. Past and future don't exist. The mind wants to live in past and future, but we are not our minds. We are the awareness that is able to witness the mind and become, a, uh, become uh, an observer of the mind and the body and the emotions. And I suddenly realized I, I could access this witnessing presence and it was peaceful. And so this is what I, what I would consider maybe my first awakening experience. Suddenly I realized that I can, I can step out of my mind and not identify with it. And there's peace. And I go to my cousin's house later that day and she's got the book on her shelf. And I think, oh my gosh, that's the book. And I, I grab it I, and just read it and it really just transforms me. Suddenly I have all the answers. I have the roadmap of how to find peace and fulfillment. And I realized then, you know, my question was who's made it? Nobody's made it. Celebrities haven't made it, etc. But I recognize, oh, enlightened people, they quote unquote have made it. They've realized 
peace in the now. So there is potential to actually find peace. Life isn't just a sick joke. So I had the practices, but of course, you know, depression was still there. Um, you know, I'm still dealing with all of this, uh, you know, this insecurity and heartbreak and, and uh, also feeling just the general sense of nihilism and, and, you know, teenage stuff as well, just, just being a teenager. What's interesting is, you know, a lot of teenagers go through stuff that I'm describing here. It's not unusual. Um, but for whatever reason, I've just been very, very sensitive. Looking back, I can kind of attribute my sensitivity to the fact that for much of my childhood up until I was about 13, 14, 15, if I look back, I remember I was able to actually access the spacious awareness that was peaceful and free and I wasn't suffocating within the ego. But it was only around this period, about 15, where suddenly I became fully identified with the mind and the suffering was was unbearable. It was like, a, like I said, it was like I was suffocating. And so other people, I guess they can handle that type of suffocation, you could say. Um, but I just couldn't. And like I wasn't able to sleep. I was having an incredible insomnia for weeks. Just really not able to sleep. Maybe get like an hour of sleep towards the morning. And then suddenly my alarm would go off. And it was just really, really hard. Um, but... I had the practices now to be in the now. So I was practicing mindfulness and I recognized this is the only game worth playing. This is the only thing that is worth doing in life, period. Everything else will fall under this. My career, my relationships, my work, everything will fall under being in the now, being in the present moment, you know, being spiritual, practicing these things. But that was the only practices that I had. Um, and so I decided one day I'll sit to meditate. You know, instead of just practicing mindfulness out and about, I'll sit to meditate. So I sat down, I closed my eyes, I crossed my legs. I turned inwards, like I turned my intention inwards. And suddenly I felt like my spine becoming erect and like bending and it was stiff, stiffening. And my neck was like arching and, and, um, it's very uncomfortable, not super painful, but like very uncomfortable because it was like, this was happening to me spontaneously. I didn't have it. I didn't try to do this. And I, if I tried to fight it, I wasn't able to. So I thought, okay, that's really weird. Opened my eyes, came out of the meditation. I thought, okay, I'm not going to meditate. I don't know what that's about. And I left it at that. And I said, you know what? I'll just practice being in the now throughout my day, whether I'm working on school, having hang out with friends, whatever it is, I'll be in the now. Looking back now, we see, you know, I'm, I'm 15 at the time. And this was the first signs of Kundalini awakening. Kundalini process was that, that spinal experience. The first time I turned inwards in meditation. So I'm 15. I practiced this for, you know, three years, just being in the now, being in the now. And I'm making progress. I'm finding peace. Of course, there's this ongoing work to be done. I'm also developing as, as a person in general. Finally, I find myself, it's 2012 now, I am 18 or 19, and I go to attend a 10-day Vipassana meditation retreat. And so here I learn how to meditate, sitting still in meditation. And I was able to overcome any of the uh, resistance prior. And I was able to sit and I found myself going into samadhi by like, you know, the few days in I was entering into deep deep states of meditation sitting for like multiple hours two hours I think was uh was one of my sessions over two hours I just sat whereas you know a few weeks a few days before I wasn't able to sit for five minutes so the huge leaps were made but also very difficult it was a very difficult retreat incredibly difficult um things were coming up from my past to be processed to be seen and released um you know, childhood stuff, anxiety, a lot, a lot of work was being done, very, very difficult things, a lot of pain as well, physical pain within my body was coming up to be released. And so this was 2012. And now you may be familiar with the, the ideas of the Mayan calendar that said, you know, December 21st, 2012, the world was going to end something was going to shift. And, you know, people were saying, you know, there would be an ascension that takes place. And we thought, you know, maybe the world, the, the, the poles, the magnetic poles, North and South poles were going to, you know, shift places and it was going to cause ca catastrophe around the world. You know, maybe the world was going to end, there would be a world war or something like that. So there was like all these ideas of like, you know, December 21st, 2012, the world's going to change, the world's going to end. For whatever reason, I bought into some of these ideas and I felt this immense pressure to figure this awakening stuff out to realize enlightenment to become self-realized before it's too late so i had this immense pressure to meditate and figure this stuff out and i was doing a lot of meditation i was doing a lot of uh inquiry and exploration within uh you know neo-advaita and non-duality and what happened was it's december 11th or 12th 2012 
and you know I've got like a couple weeks left before the world ends so like I'm feeling this immense immense pressure and I start you know doing in a very intense inquiry into what is true what is true like in a non-dual inquiry you know what is true and suddenly it dawns on me nothing is true everything is an illusion everything is a dream this is all made up like a mirage arising in consciousness the world is all a dream and then I looked at myself and I realized even Brent doesn't exist Brent is just a dream the ego the me the sense of self the I doesn't exist what is Brent it's just a sound that you know people have always referred to this body and, and mind as and then I thought that was a character but it's just a sound and this idea of me what is me if I look inside myself I can't find a center that it would be me um, that's Brent that's unique from everybody else in my mind there's just a thought that would arise and then the thought would pass away and then another thought would arise and then that would pass away so there was nothing at its center it was empty and this was the realization of, of no self as they talk about in non-duality in Buddhism and so when this dawned on me suddenly I realized well that means nobody else is real either and I felt this opening in my crown in my head and suddenly I had this expansive awareness I became to I began to kind of abide there and just watch everything happening on its own the the, the phenomena within my own body the world and I realized it's all a dream and this was I thought this okay this was like some sort of awakening some liberation right what they talk about in non-duality neo advaita you know I it realized it I thought okay this is interesting but this is very spooky because that means nobody else is real it means I'm not real so like what's the point of any of this and it became like very very nihilistic and also physically uncomfortable there was like this physical feeling of like just eeriness about it all you know walking around and looking at people and realizing you know these people aren't real they're like NPCs or like you know characters in a video game they're not real and I couldn't talk to anybody about it because you know how foolish would that be if you're like you're, you're you realize you're dreaming what's the point of going and talking to a character in your dream they're not real it was just I was a very alone and lonely and isolated in this place it's called Zen sickness emptiness sickness and then I came to discover this because at the same time I was in a Buddhism course in university and I never did any of the readings because I was so focused on all the spiritual stuff so the schoolwork was just not a priority and you know I'm, I'm in this scary spooky sort of uh, depersonalized dissociative state and I just happened to pick up one of my textbooks. I open up to a random page and I read there, you know, sometimes uh, Zen monks, uh, they experience some of the adverse effects of meditating too much and they call it Zen sickness or emptiness sickness. And it's when, when they get stuck in the void, stuck in emptiness and everything becomes like a dream. And I thought, oh my gosh, this is exactly what I'm experiencing. And I thought, okay, this is a known thing. Thankfully, I opened up this book to the right page at the right time. I'll go and talk to my professor. They'll be able to help me. Next day, I go to my professor. I remember we're, we're standing next to each other, but it felt like I was a million miles away talking to her from a very, very far place because I was so out of my body, so disconnected. It was very, very spooky. And I remember telling her, you know, I'm experiencing this in this book, you know, Zen sickness. Just, just read this paragraph. She reads it and says, okay, that's pretty interesting, but I can't help you, Brent, because I don't practice any of this. I just teach it. And I felt extremely, extremely alone and betrayed because, you know, I thought this person, you know, their professor, PhD, I thought they were going to help me with this and they weren't able to. And this further contributed to me feeling like I was completely alone. You know, that's, that's a response that an NPC would say to you. That's a response that a person in a dream might say to you if you try to talk to them about how you realize it's all a dream. It's like, I can't help you. So now I'm alone. So... I'm experiencing this DPDR, the Zen sickness, emptiness sickness, completely dissociated. You know, I'm th I'm also very confused because I'm like, isn't this what Zen is all about? Isn't this what all the neo advaita non duality is all about? I'm reading the spiritual text and it seems to make perfect sense. You know, I'm reading like texts like, um, you know, Avaruta Gita, and I'm reading, you know, the works of some of the non dual teachers, and I'm like, yeah, this is what I'm experiencing, but this doesn't feel right. I don't feel like peace. I don't feel bliss. I don't feel calm. I don't feel happy or joy or anything good i feel totally dry and stale and cold the world became very cold and so how i overcame this was actually by accident um at the time leading up to this i was a vegetarian i had ideas about that you know how that would help me in my spiritual journey because i was you know trying to make it before the world ended on the 21st so i, I stopped eating meat i think i was actually a vegan 
or eating a vegan diet. And um, so when I realized, you know, this DPDR state, this is a Zen sickness state, I said to hell with all that diet stuff, eat whatever I want. I went, I grabbed like some, some steak or pork chop or something, ate that. So eating meat suddenly was, was grounding. I didn't do it intentionally to ground myself, but it seems like I was led to intuitively. That grounded me a little bit. I'm still in this spacey, you know, state. And I thought, okay, let's go see what yoga is like. Let's go see what a yoga class is like, you know, being in this very spaced out, like, you know, dissociative state. Let's see what it's like to move my body and stuff. So I go to yoga and I start, you know, doing the practices and moving my body and stuff. And movement also brought me back into the body. Awareness of the body ba brought me back into the body. Feeling my feet on the floor brought me back into the body. You know, things that they talk about in yoga, being with the breath and the body and all this kind of stuff. So naturally, I found myself becoming more and more grounded. And insights were also coming. I became to understand what had happened to me. You know, a lot of energy awakened up in my crown, but I, what, that energy wasn't balanced out across my whole body. So if you happen to be experiencing this, DPDR, Zen Sickness, I've got a book on my on my website, brandspirit.com. It's totally free. It's called The No-Nonsense Grounding Guide. It's all about how to ground yourself when you're experiencing this kind of stuff because it has happened to a lot of people. It can happen for many reasons. Spiritual exploration is one, you know, philosophical contemplation, drug use, etc. Um, it's a free book, and I've written it solely to help people that are in this place that I was in because, like, genuinely, it was the most horrifying thing. And so... You can check that out. There's an audio book there. I've also got some talks on my on my channel and podcast where I talk a little bit more about this stuff. Um, so suddenly, you know, I, I'm, I'm feeling a little bit more grounded. I'm more in my body. I'm feeling this, you know, expansive state of consciousness kind of settling. And I'm a little bit more able to like be in the world and in the body. So how I started to now move through the world was like I was just stuck in this very dry isolated emptiness sort of place but I was a little bit more grounded and for the next couple of years I just kind of hung out there and I thought that was that was it I thought that was it for the journey because um, you know like I said I was exploring all these new Advaita and, and non-dual teachings that you know validated this and I thought okay you know this is it it's not peaceful or joyful and then then sometimes they would even say it's not supposed to be it's supposed to be just it's real it's true that doesn't mean it feels good but the fact that the matter was in my heart, like I wanted to feel the love of God. I had some sense, you know, I had realized God. I had known God, what that was, divinity. I'm not talking about a man in the sky. I'm talking about divinity. I had known it, but I wasn't feeling it. Right? I wanted, and I wanted to feel it. I wanted God in my heart. That's the only way I could really describe it. I wanted God in my heart. And it was like, you know, this very sad, melancholy type of, type of longing. And I would feel this warmth in my heart when I would feel this. And I also recognize, you know, despite what all this non-dual reductionist, transcendental um, sort of ice cold teachings talk about, you know, I also want relationships. I want meaningful friendships, meaningful partner, romance. I want these things. And I started to just give myself permission to, to feel those desires, those unfulfilled desires. And so I started to just, you know, just just put my hands on my heart and tell myself I love you. I love you. It was a teaching that I learned from Matt Kahn. And at the same time, I also learned about law of attraction and manifestation. And of course, as we know, law of attraction and manifestation, it's got all to do with emotion. Feeling good brings good things to you. That's your vibration. And so I started to practice these things. And that also brought me back into the body, into the heart to feel emotions to get excited to feel joyful to also be in the world to think you know okay yeah, i want to manifest things and it grounded me once again and so i began to practice these things law of attraction telling myself i love you self-love and i started to come deeply into my body and i felt this awakening that had happened up in my crown was starting to now move into my body and so i started to like uh you know manifest a lot of stuff you know manifesting like like crazy instant manifestations it becomes like second nature to me i'm just able to manifest anything i want and like like um i'm realizing it, it it's like just very very powerful and so as i began you know my journey you know through heartbreak of course like i said you know there's this deep longing for romance and for like meaningful connection and you know i've glossed over but leading up to where we are now like there were other partners and for the most part they all just like uh just hurt me in some some way or another and around this time um i'm i'm seeing one girl one woman we're, we're dating and when we were together it was incredible it was awesome 
but there were times where she would just disappear for like a week, two weeks at a time, like complete radio silence. It was like she disappeared off the face of the earth out of nowhere. Um, and that was very, very jarring. And it made me feel really, really, uh, you know, isolated and alone. And like, when I say like she would disappear off the face of the earth, like I really mean it. Like there'd be times where she would say, you know, all right, I'm just, I'm leaving my house, you know, I'll, I'll be over in, in, you know, 15 minutes. And then like, I wouldn't see her and I wouldn't, she wouldn't answer my calls, you know, nothing. It was just like radio silence. And then two weeks later, she'd be like, Hey, so what's up? And I was so afraid of like losing her that I wouldn't even bring up, you know, what just happened. Cause I was like, you know, insecure. And I was just, just happy that she said anything. And so we would just hang out again and as if nothing happened and it was like very very jarring and uncomfortable but through this i learned that i have to love myself i have to love myself and it was actually this is what provided the context for me to learn that you know that i love you meditation it's what once again like it, it positioned me to learn that I, this is what i needed to do so i began doing this i love you practice i love you practice learn that you know people can come and go but i have to always be here for myself right and that doesn't mean you know we we disregard relationships but you know we got to take care of ourselves as well because people have their own stuff going on and we can't be dependent on them to love us unless we love ourselves. So I really was learning this stuff deeply. And this was, these are challenging uh, lessons for me to learn because I came from like a very, very ice cold type of type of background. You know, it was like already wrapped him in Neo Advaita non-duality, which had nothing to do with heart chakra stuff. It was all about crown chakra, knowledge based, very masculine. And, you know, I was also like, you know, playing punk rock music, hardcore punk music. So it was like very, very like masculine and, um, you know, not, not very emotional at all. So all of this stuff was difficult for me to like figure out, but I was suffering so much that I had to. And so I'm, you know, manifesting a lot, like crazy life is amazing. I'm learning, I'm learning to love myself is incredible. Eventually I recognize, you know, the, the relationship with this, this woman is not going to work out. And I just love myself really, really intensely and give myself permission to let it go and to feel you know, the release. And I actually felt like incredible release. It was like, finally, I just let it go. And I realized, you know, it's not going to work out and that's okay. We'll move on. I just love myself really intensely. Next day, I go on Facebook and an old friend of mine from high school, a different, um, a different girl than the, the, the initial girl that, uh, you know, um, broke my heart and uh, began this process. Um, she posted on Facebook uh, something about Alan Watts. And so I thought, oh, you know, I like Alan Watts. Shoot her a message. Hey, you know, it's been a while. What's up? Saw what you posted about Alan Watts. Didn't know you were into that stuff. And we began to talk and she says, yeah, yeah, you know, um, and like, yeah, so what's going, to be on, what's been going on with you? And I, she, I asked her that and she says, oh, the day just yesterday, my fiance and I broke up. And I thought, oh, okay, interesting. And she says, yeah, you know, why don't you come over and we can catch up and, um, you know, talk about spirituality and stuff. She's like, I could use some company. I'm, I'm kind of hurting. I'm like, all right, cool. Go over to her house and there's immediate like, you know, sparks and, 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 uh, you know, romance. And, and we end up starting to date for, uh, the next couple months. And it's incredibly mystical and magical. And it's wrapped up in synchronicity. It's wrapped up in all of the law of attraction stuff, the manifestation stuff. I'm just like, still like manifesting things like like incredibly, it's like really, really exciting experience. On top of that, there's also energetic phenomena happening between us. Like in my body, when we're together, there was like some energetic stuff was happening. It was super trippy, but it, it made me feel, you know, like I was like, oh, finally, finally, I love myself. And I found like, you know, quote unquote, the one I found like the person that's, you know, life was had, um, you know, had me destined to be with. And there was a lot of synchronicity wrapped up around this this connection. Um, and I, I don't even want to give too much information about it, but there was just so much leading back all the way back to like, you know, when we first met, which we barely met, really. We were just, we were just like acquaintances in high school, but like way back then. And I recognized, you know, she was there like down the hall from me when I was going through the really, really dark, dark stuff. And so it was all made sense. You know, she's actually been around my spiritual journey this whole time. All this is incredible, incredible synchronicities and stuff. And it, so it just made me feel, you know, validated. Like, you know, this is the person that I'm you know, meant to be with. And, and this is, we're going to, together, we're going to be spiritual power couple. And we're going to grow and heal and do the law of attraction. And, you know, I was just like on top of the world feeling incredible. You know, I, I thought, finally, finally. 
So, you know, and uh, I'm setting myself up. I'm describing how incredible it was. And it's only been two and a half months or so. I know, like, we had incredible experiences. Um, it's like September 2015. And there's like a, a blood moon. And uh, we're at this blood moon sort of eclipse of viewing event. And, you know, I start to see like suddenly, just like in a flash, suddenly I could see everyone's aura and stuff. Like all of this trippy stuff started happening. And this made me think, you know, the ascension is happening. Um, we're all going to ascend into 5D consciousness. I'm here with my girlfriend. And, you know, all of this was just incredible. We're going to have incredible, incredible life. It's really getting set up here now. her and I decide to explore some psychedelics and I start doing this. I love you practice to myself. I love you. I love you. I love you. It's very, very intense, very incredible. And I experience, you know, Kundalini awakening, Kundalini rising. It is indescribable. You know, the, the, the beauty and magnificent magnificence of it, the way it felt. Um, it was like a freight train, rode up my spine but it wasn't painful it was, just, it was very very orgasmic and intense and, and incredible and there was incre incredible experiences of like you know oneness and love and unconditional love and it was very 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 incredible um i don't want to talk too much about it because i want to talk about the darkness here but i want to set the stage for now the descent into the dark night so i'm like really at like incredible peak like spiritual peak beyond spiritual peaks, like, you know, Kundalini awakening in this most incredible way with this incredible partner. I'm feeling, you know, this incredible uh, love in my heart and manifesting all this stuff. It's incredible, right? Next day, go to say goodbye to her and there's like, just like a thin layer of distance between us that I can kind of perceive. I'm thinking, oh, this is interesting. Like something is, something is different here. It's like this distance over the next couple weeks, entire relationship became very very distant i think both of us had to pull away and we kind of you know descended into like um you know the, the the relationship crumbled so at the same time i had somehow found myself working for a car dealership i have no interest in cars i'm just there because you know like quite literally a friend called me on the phone and said hey brian you want this job i said all right sounds like the universe calling so i take this job i'm just at this car dealership and The two guys that I was working with, one of them had to go away. Somebody had died in his family or something. He had to like go overseas or something. And the other guy had already scheduled a two-week vacation. And there's just three of us in this like parts department at this car dealership. I worked there for like like two months. I was so new. I wasn't trained properly. I wasn't respected. They didn't even give me a uniform. I was wearing like my own clothes. They didn't even like I was so new, and uh, you know I didn't have my own uniform. And these two guys are going on vacation and they're telling me, oh, Brent, you're going to run the whole parts department while we're gone for like, you know, a week at least. And I, um, I'm thinking, you know, I don't know if I could do that, but all right. So the boss sits me down and he says, all right, Brent, I'm leaving in like, you know, 45 minutes. I'm going to show you how to order the parts. So he pulls up this really old computer, like, you know, anyway, he, he tells me, okay, you're going to enter this number and then you're going to press F1, F3, enter, enter, go to the drop down menu, press seven, make sure you don't press four. And then you're going to enter in all the parts, make sure they're all correct. Then you're going to just press, you know, F6, F7, enter, whatever. And then you're going to press order. Make sure that you get it right. And I'm just like, he's like, you got that? And I'm just like, yeah, man, I, I got that. But inside, I was like, I don't got that. Like, I don't got that at all. It's a lot of pressure. Like I said, I don't even have a uniform here. And these guys are telling me every day I'm going to have to order, you know, ten to $15,000 worth of parts on this old computer, which, you know, like he said, you know, it's all these different drop down menus, all this stuff. I was like, I'm not ready for this. I'm not trained for this. It's too much pressure. I was being set up to fail. I'm like, yeah, I got that, man. All right. All right. So they go out for a smoke break, these two. Then I get a text message from from my girlfriend at the time, my girlfriend. And she says, hey, Brent, you know, uh, I met up with my fiance yesterday, my ex-fiance, and uh, we're going to get back together. And, you know, you and I aren't, aren't a thing anymore. 
And suddenly I start having this panic attack. My heart is racing. It's like my heart is bumping, like in the way that you see in cartoons, you know, it's like intense, uh, hearts beating very, very intensely. These two guys are on a smoke break. So there, I'm just in the office by myself and something comes over me. I grab my jacket. And I look at my feet and my feet are moving and they're just walking on their own. I'm, they're walking out the door. And I walk out the door and I just leave this car dealership. And I just get on the bus and just go home. And these people are calling me from the car dealership. They're calling me, you know, wondering where the hell I went. I just don't answer. And that's when I began the purification process of Kundalini Awakening. It was very, very dark. And so... I recognized that I would sit in my bed and the, my bed became the Bodhi tree under that I was under. You know, they, they talk about the Buddha sat on the Bodhi tree. Christ was on the cross. My bed was my cross. My bed was my Bodhi tree. And so now all of this difficult stuff was starting to arise, like very difficult stuff. And I would just sit in meditation and just say, I love you over and over and over again. It's anything that was arising, um, you know, Emotions, thoughts, feelings, sensations, all of it was arising. And I was just saying, I love you. And it was incredibly, incredibly difficult. Um, you know, I I remember just, just crying, crying um, every day. And, and I was never one to really cry. And there's just a lot of crying. There was you know, vomiting happening. I was shaking. I had these like energetic fevers where I would feel like this like rumbling happen. And I would like feel my temperature rising and this energy would start moving through me. And it was like, I was having these energetic fevers. It was like, I was, it was like, I was going to die or something. And this was going on. And I just remember staying in my room and experiencing this. And throughout this, you know, I'm trying to like, you know, piece together things from what had just happened, you know, and this, this relationship fell apart. And then I recognized something drew me to some information online, you know, that this was a twin flame encounter. And the idea behind twin flames is that, uh, you know, there's like somebody out there that is a spiritual like match for you, you could say. And, and when you meet, it's supposed to be really intense, really incredible. And in some cases, Kundalini can be awakened in the presence of your twin flame. And there's wrapped up in, you know, synchronicity and mysticism and all this kind of stuff. And I recognize, oh, this is what I'm dealing with, a twin flame. And I thought, okay, I have to figure out if I can heal myself, I can get you know, back with this partner, per partner, and it'll be, I'll be okay. And, um, you know, I tried to like, uh, stay in touch and, you know, telling her, you know, I'm, I'm really hurting. And she would say things like to me, yeah, yeah, it's difficult to go through a breakup, you know, um, make sure you stay hydrated. And this was like incredibly painful to hear because it was like, well, you're the one who did this to me. And now you're giving me advice of how to go through it come on, like, you know, it's like if I stab somebody and then I'm like, oh yeah, here's how you treat the wound. It's like, well, you couldn't, you didn't have to stab me in the first place. So I, I think looking back, you know, like, um, it's all love. She was, she was feeling guilty and, you know, she was just trying to help really. But there was like also like some, some gaslighting, you know, she would say, oh, well, well we weren't even really together. So it wasn't a real relationship. But I'm thinking, well, you know, you told me to call you my girlfriend and like you met my family and stuff. Like, you know, I don't know what you mean. It wasn't a real relationship. But anyway, like all of this pain was happening. And some of this is kind of embarrassing and, and uh, difficult to talk about just because like I, you know, I've, I feel very vulnerable. So I appreciate you out there listening and uh, holding space for me. But, um, you know, it's very, very difficult to go through all of this, especially because this was all over text message. Too. I didn't even feel like I had the respect to, you know, re receive closure in person. But I understood that twin flame is like very intense for both parties, very, very intense. And so this was her way of navigating this whole like twin flame thing. Eventually, I recognize, you know, um, the twin flame is not meant to be like a person that you're like destined to be with. Twin flame comes to light you on fire to, to catalyze and accelerate your awakening journey. And then that's it, period. And that's what they did. And I, I eventually came to a point where I was like, you know, very, very grateful for, for her for playing her role perfectly in my life to set me up for this difficult but incredible evolutionary process that I was going through with Kundalini and spiritual awakening and everything. So... I'm back in my in my bed for the next two months. Basically, this is where I, I stay. Six, seven hours a day, I'm just meditating and I'm just doing this I love you stuff. And really, really dark stuff is coming up. Like, like I'm, like I said, crying, shaking, vomiting, having these like fevers. I would sleep in a towel at one point because I recognize I'm just sweating all night and my, my sheets are getting drenched. So I just said, you know, I'll just sleep in a towel. So I started just wrapping myself in a towel. That was my blanket. 
a lot of difficult stuff nightmares as well like this process didn't stop like there was no reprieve there was no like okay it's over or anything it was like when i would go to sleep there would be nightmares and the nightmares were like really intense psychedelic kind of like vivid and like horrifying and they weren't just like like there were like spooky beings and creatures and demons kind of coming for me and stuff but there was also like i was like being eaten by animals i was like you know getting ripped apart by animals and stuff or stuff like that i was also like having like incredible emotional releases within dreams where i was like yelling at people like like furious at people like, yelling screaming like crying all this intense emotional stuff was happening in dreams so it was all like this purification stuff there were also some good parts to this like some interesting things some some you know divine uh, encounters and, and like um wisdom and stuff was being shared and like and like uh, beings were coming to heal me and stuff and like i can talk about that in another uh in another time but now i really want to focus on the dark stuff like i said to like let people know you know i've been through dark stuff and if you are it's it's not unusual per se and we all go through our own dark stuff in our own way now i had the fortunate you know grace to understand about kundalini eventually so i described some of what i experienced to his friend and they said oh yeah you know i heard ram das talked about this it's kundalini and i thought oh kundalini i heard about kundalini I'm, a, I'm aware of kundalini i just didn't realize that i was in a kundalini awakening process oh my gosh now it starts to make sense and i was already familiar with teachers that had gone through kundalini awakening process like matt khan like ram das so i thought okay these guys have gone through it you know they came out to a point where they're stable maybe that's what's happening to me maybe i'm gonna like get over this and it's gonna work out for me like it worked out for them and so i had like this faith now in the process so i would sit in my bed in my bodhi tree under my under my Bodhi tree and what I would do is I would make an agreement with myself I said okay you know I've got a glass of water I mean now it's empty but I have a glass of water I'm gonna sit in my bed and I'm not gonna involve any other person in my process so if I'm having if I'm sitting in meditation and something is coming up about something from my past or something I'm not gonna go grab my phone and call or text that person and say hey you know you did this to me five years ago or something that's my agreement. I'm going to keep this to myself in solitude and space. I'm not going to involve other people. So I'm not going to cause chaos and, and damage relationships as a result of my process. Okay, that was one pact I made. The other pact I made was in my bed, I'm not going to hurt myself. No matter what, I'm not going to bang my head against the wall or like, you know, cut myself or anything like that. It's not something I've ever done, but I, I made this agreement. I'm not going to do that. So I'm not going to harm others. So I'm not going to harm myself. And I've got a glass of water. And I know that I can survive on a glass of water for, you know, like a couple days, three days or whatever. So I'm going to be okay. And in my bed, under my Bodhi tree, anything can arise. Anything. And it's going to be okay, as long as I keep to my agreements. And I had that understanding in place, because I understood that this was a healing and purification process, but that doesn't mean it was easy. And I also had the teachers that were encouraging me, you know. There's a great talk by Matt Kahn. It's called Everything is Here to Help You. And uh, in that talk, he doesn't talk explicitly about kundalini where he talks about the, the purification the healing the difficulty of the of the spiritual awakening journey and he says everything that arises is here to help you it's all coming to be healed and purified and cleansed and, and released and you know you have to have faith that it's all going to work out and i played that video on loop it's like an hour long i played it on loop throughout the night um because i was waking up in the middle of the night like sweating having some nightmare and i would hear matt's matt you know soothing voice saying you know it's all going to work out everything is going to be okay and i thought this guy better not be full of shit because I'm giving everything to this idea that it's going to work out. Like all, all my eggs in one basket. I'm hoping that it's going to work out. And so these are some of the difficulty that I was experiencing. Um, I thought, okay, you know, there was a, at some point I decided, you know, I would leave my house or go out and I went, okay, where can I go? Okay, I'll go to a yoga class because at yoga class, that's where they say, you know, everyone is welcome, you know, listen to your body. This is a safe space, no judgment, etc. So I said, okay, I'll go to a yoga class and we'll see what comes up. So go to this yoga class, and in this particular studio, they begin in uh, Shavasana, child's uh, corpse pose, laying flat on the floor. And then eventually they begin the class, and, and so I'm laying there, and this like eruption of like volcanic lava begins to like come up from my, from my, my sacral chakra, my second chakra. And it's, it, it, it's like erupting and it's hot and it's uncomfortable, very, very uncomfortable. And everyone around me in this class, they eventually, you know, begin to start doing sun salutations and, you know, doing all the yoga poses and stuff. But I'm still just laying there on the floor on my back, 
experiencing this like lava coming up. And once again, I'm just staying with it, saying, I love you. It's okay that you're here. You're uncomfortable. I don't like you, but I still love you. And when I say I love you, it means I recognize that you're not separate from anything else. That you two are part of the divine light because everything is divine light. Even this volcanic eruption that's very uncomfortable coming from my, my, uh, you know, my groin area. And so I'm dealing with this and I can feel everybody around me is like going through the class and they're kind of like looking at me like, what's this guy doing? And I'm laying on the floor, like kicking like the air. I'm like kicking and I'm like clenching my fists and I'm like, just like, you know, like jolting. And I like, I want this discomfort to like be released. And if, it, if it's not clear, this, this like volcanic eruption wasn't Kundalini awakening. This was something like emotional coming up. And like, I look, looked at it as, as like, uh, very much some sort of sexual hangup, like frustration, betrayal, jealousy, um, guilt, shame, all of that kind of stuff that, you know, the, the, uh, that our culture and also wrapped up in like, you know, general sentiments of, you know, you know, how, how anyone would feel when you're, you've been cheated on. Right. So this is what I was feeling because intense betrayal was coming up. And I remember just sitting with it and saying, you know, I'll go through this difficulty. I'll go through these feelings of, of resentment and, and anger and shame and guilt. And uh, the whole class and the whole class was like over an hour. It must have been like an hour and 15 minutes. I'm just going through this, laying on the floor on my back, going through this. And like I said, everyone around me is just doing the regular yoga class. And I remember thinking, you know, these people better not say anything to me after. Like, you know, hey, don't come back here or like what the hell's wrong with you because they said, listen to my body and I'm listening to my body and, and this is real yoga that I'm going through. So they better not say anything with perfect timing as their as a class began to wrap up, everybody sat down in, um, uh, you know, like, a child, uh, uh, like a seated Lotus position and they were wrapping up the class. And at the same time, all of the difficulty that was, was over for me. The, 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 the emotional lava was just gone. So I was able to sit up and then say namaste to the teacher like everybody else. I was like, namaste. I was smiling. I was beaming like there was some healing had happened. And then I left and, and nobody said anything. I think they understood, you know, this guy's going through something. But there was a genuine healing that took place. There was a genuine release that took place there. And so I started to understand that this is actually working out for me. Like this process is actually healing me. And like, I'm actually going through something and I can like, trust it more. And it's, I didn't, I wasn't, I wasn't a victim of what was happening to me per se. Along the same theme, like this, you know, second chakra, uh, like sexual hangup type theme. There was another experience that I had, like maybe, you know, a couple weeks later or something where in my second chakra area, my growing area, I, I perceived like something like a, a, a baseball sized ball of lead was like just in there and it was very uncomfortable like extremely uncomfortable there was no way or movement or anything that I could do to like get it out and release it it was just just there uncomfortable um and it made me like really just not like being in my body it made me hate my body and this sort of thing um I, I there was feelings and thoughts of like like I said shame guilt frustration betrayal um um you know all the sexual hang-ups that we we might have was all wrapped up there and it wasn't painful it was just, it was uncomfortable as much as you can be uncomfortable before anything becomes painful so it was like the most uncomfortable thing i've ever experienced actually and with this i wasn't able to experience the the moment of dissolution or dissolving of that lead ball i wasn't able to what happened was i fell asleep and when i woke up it was gone and when i woke up it was gone and i felt like something had shifted in me to do with you know sexuality and and i felt like lighter right so once again i had evidence that this is working this is healing there were other experiences when you know i had like this intense like pain in my chest like you know like some sort of like uh tension and being closed off in my chest and then i experienced like the crumbling open of something like something opened up like 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 the barriers dissolved and there was an opening so even that was like a little bit uncomfortable but then afterwards there was like wow feeling open right and so these are some of the difficult things that i've experienced um i also experienced like an adrenaline rush for like two three days straight i just lay in bed 
doing this I love you practice in a full-blown adrenaline rush heart racing blood pumping breathing heavy sweating legs f like full of you know, adrenaline filled blood ready to run or fight but it was going on for so long that my legs turned to complete jello like the muscles were just like like completely like just like a bag of water like it was really really weird and intense and like I understood intuitively because intuitive insights were coming to me uh, either inwardly or I was like drawn to a certain reading or video or something that was you know guiding me and I came to learn you know that I'm dealing with some sort of uh, adrenal issue here um, not issue but like an adrenal like uh, process and so I had to drink a lot of water and I thought okay I'll drink a lot a lot of water and I started to eat watermelon and this helped me and I understood you know I was having my fight or flight process kind of go through a sort of shift and sort of change uh, maybe like you know it no longer serves me in the way that it did uh, moving forward I no longer need to have that fight or flight in the way that I was like you know um, operating like like uh, like a caveman you know because because I'm not a caveman so like I don't need to be you know having fight or flight experiences sitting in my room safe like reading a text message because that was what would happen to me in the in the past somebody would send me a text message and I would go into fight or flight as if like somebody told me they were going to kill me so now this kind of was being, you know, processed and changed and the fight or flight uh, issue um, today, like I can still go into fight or flight, but I'm much more like um, less, much less susceptible to doing that unless there's like an actual threat. And so, you know, and that's not perfect. Like, you know, it's not like I'll add, not like, you know, you'll never catch me having an adrenaline rush unless I'm like dying or something. You could, but like it's a little less uh, touchy. Um. I would also have these like really, really intense, intense like, head rushes. So sometimes I would like get up out of bed, put my feet on the floor and stand up. And it was like, like a tornado or something was like exploding up into my head. It wasn't like uncomfortable, but it was super, super intense. And like, I would lose all sense of who I was, where I was, any of that. And I would just be like, like completely out of it. Um, so that was difficult because it took me like maybe like 20 minutes to kind of recover from those experiences and then get you know, trying to walk around and do things that I had to do. Um, there was some other experiences where like, I, I run really weird experience where I couldn't read. Like I would like look at a like text and I was able to like read the words, but like there was no meaning attached to it whatsoever. Like I just couldn't read. And that was kind of freaky because I thought like, you know, am I becoming stupid? Like I have no idea what any of this means. And it used to mean something. And now it's just like, doesn't mean anything. So that was weird. Obviously that's, that's gone now. Um, there was some stuff from past lives coming up. Um, difficult stuff. Um, one story that I'm comfortable talking about is, you know, there was like, I was meditating this, I love you, practice, I love you, practice, I love you, I love you. And then I, I left my body and I found myself in like some sort of different environment. And I was at like a shipyard. And at the shipyard, somebody had given me a piece of paper and it had the list of like 10 or 20 names. And I understood these names were all people that had died in a shipwreck. And they were like my shipmates. And for whatever reason, you know, I wasn't on that ship or something. But anyway, I, intense grief came over me, intense sadness. And I guess this was something from a past life or something. But anyway, I just stayed with the sadness. I continued the practice. I love you. Came back to my room, to my bed. And it was like, I describe it as like, I, I took off a t-shirt made of sadness that I was wearing my whole life. And I didn't even realize it. Like for, for the first time in my life, I was, not sad about that anymore and I didn't even know I was sad about that because of course it was like from some sort of past life and so there was like healing happening there but I had to stay with the sadness I had to really stay with it intensely um around this there were also like uh just general interpersonal issues that were coming up like intense intense like ancestral family clearing was happening that um you know clearly had something to do with my inward inner process but was also like you know involved the drama of like uh, you know my, my relationships as well and so that was difficult to navigate as well because you know I thought you know am I causing all of this you know like what's happening here but I understood that you know nobody awake nobody wakes up in isolation we're all connected so we all benefit as we all if anybody does any healing we all benefit from it and we're all pushed towards a little bit of healing ourselves and that can be difficult it can be uncomfortable and there are also some kind of freaky experiences where I was like I could mess with electronics at will. Like I could just put my hand over a speaker and like make it make static and stuff. So that was like cool and novel, but it was also just like, man, like what's happening. So there's a little bit like a, of, of confusion and stuff there. I would also just experience like intense um, shaking and like these, what you would call Kriyas. Sometimes at night I would find, I would like find myself like 
I would like almost come to awareness and I'd be like in like the weirdest yoga poses like in my bed like I'd be doing like snail pose or something and it felt really good but that was kind of weird too um these kriyas these, t- these types of experiences yoga poses and that sort of thing I would also lay in bed and just like shake and the shaking um I thought it was just happening inwardly until there was like a bolt got loose on my bed frame and that bolt would squeak in sync with the way that I was shaking. And that's when I recognized, oh my gosh, I've been shaking all night, like like physically shaking. And that bolt was like, you know, letting me know that I wasn't just in my head. So this subtle like vibration was happening. Um, this was all taking place over like two months after Kundalini Awakening. Um, and But there was like gradual, gradual like uh, sort of the healing was happening gradually and eventually things got less and less intense and more and more calm and stable. Now, after I'm like now like stable, I recognized the process is working out in my favor. Like it's a healing process, a purification process. It's like going to surgery to get like a tumor removed. It's like a it's like a caterpillar going into a cocoon or like, you know, an adolescent going through puberty. It's good. So what I would do was then I became like really almost like invincible and trusting and, and really deep, really deep faith. And so I would sit under the Bodhi tree feeling peaceful and calm. And I would say, darkness, come out. I'm going to honor you. I'm going to be with you. I'm going to recognize you as the light. I'm going to love you and see that you're not like a problem or a mistake. Come forth. I want to, I want to be with you. And I would just wait. And then dark things would start to arise. Like, Things would start to come up and I would, you know, stay with it or keep my word. I would just stay with it and keep doing the I love you practice and telling the darkness, I love you. Yeah, I see you. Namaste means the light in me recognizing the night light in you. So that's basically what I was doing. I was saying namaste to all of these things. Namaste. I see you. Yeah, you're dark, but you're still part of the light in some twisted way. You still are. Okay. And so then I would feel like things being released and healed. And it was difficult, but... Eventually, I caught on with, the, I got with the program. I understood. I'm safe. You know, I'm safe in my bed. I can feel and experience anything. It's okay. It's all going to be okay. So that was like the way I approached it. Now, after I, I started to kind of become more stable, I stopped having these intense healing cycles as frequently. Maybe it would happen every like once a week or like maybe a weekend or like then it was maybe like every month or like every three months, every six months. And eventually, I came to a point where I was like, okay, I'm, I'm pretty stable I'm I'm feeling pretty good. Now there's like a deep st- sense of peace and bliss in my body that isn't just up in the head. It's not just a concept. It's like physically in my body, permeating my body. Um, I have a sense of oneness and connectedness with everything that is like comfortable enough for me to operate in the world and recognize, you know, I'm Brent in the world, but then also we're all the same anyway. Like it's all just one thing. So there's like, it's comfort. I'm able to operate as grounded and, you know, I felt stable. And then the healing cycles kind of just sort of stopped, right? But then I recognized, okay, well, it's not like I'm perfectly healed forever. There's still ongoing work to be done. I'm still a work in progress. But the major purification period that followed the Kundalini Awakening process, that followed the Twin Flame encounter, that was beginning to be wrapped up. And this was, like, it took me about, like, about a year but the first six months were the most intense but then and then like the next six months were like i was able to you know operate and function and 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 look back and understand what was happening thankfully i because because i had all the teachings in place you know like i was traveling the spiritual journey since 15 so i was like familiar with all of this stuff so i had some sense of what was going on uh, fortunately so it only took me a little bit of time to go through the really intense stuff following that i guess it's now 2016, 2017, um, I'm just doing this, still ma- doing the, the I love you practice as often as I can, um, but I'm also feeling, you know, like I can't be just this spiritual guy now. I'm about, you know, 24 or something at the time, and I need to kind of establish some sort of direction in life, some sort of career. So I became very, very creative. I felt this creative urge as a result of the spiritual process, I became a photographer, and that became my work as a photographer. And I began to focus there, and I thought, for then, you know, 2019, I decided I'm not going to look at anything spiritual. I'm not going to meditate. I'm not going to talk about this stuff. I just want to be a grounded human being. Yes, 
spiritual awakening, all this stuff happened to me. Yes, I can experience oneness. Yes, there's like this intense love in my heart, there's bliss in my body, you know, present moment is all there is, blah, blah, blah. But let's just be Brent in the world. I did that for a year. Then December 2019, I felt called to a particular meditation. Um, and uh, this was a little bit more exciting, so I won't get too into it because, like I said, I want to focus on the darkness here. But anyway, I was told, you know, um, inwardly, I was guided that I would be a messenger to share uh, support for others going through their own awakening process. And, you know, I was reluctant. I said, you know, I don't know. If, I don't know anything about that. I don't really want to do that. And, you know, the universe, the divine Kundalini told me, uh, you know, they will give me the messages and I'll just have to share them. And, and that's the work that I'll be doing. And that's part of my life's mission. And I said, okay, I, I'm with it. Let's do it. As long as, you know, you, uh, you support me along the way. This was December, 2019. A couple weeks later, a friend says, Hey Brent, uh, I'm opening a yoga studio. Do you want to teach meditation there? So I'm like, okay, cool. So I suddenly I have a position. I'm teaching meditation. Um, I think, okay, this is part of, you know, the mission. I'm going to be like, you know, messenger supporting people. And now I'm like, you know, maybe I'm going to you know, be some sort of uh, meditation teacher and that sort of thing. Um, so like I, I just have these, these meditation events, a couple people show up like it's, it's nothing uh, super, super grand, but uh, yeah, we're, we're practicing meditation and then COVID happens. COVID happens, yoga studio shuts down. I don't know what's going on anymore. You know, I thought, okay, I don't know what I'm supposed to do. And then that's when I was, you know, called to start making talks and, and on YouTube and make a podcast and all that kind of stuff. Um, and so that's when it kind of took off and that's where we are now. Now I'm just doing this work, sharing about Kundalini Awakening in a way that is digestible. I mean, at least I'm trying to make it digestible for people um, that, you know, are coming to this without any experience because I was fortunate enough, like I said, to have a lot of sadhana, spiritual practice in place. Like I learned how to meditate. I had, I was familiar with all the teachings and stuff. And then this Kundalini awakening happened. And so I was able to navigate with, with trust and faith. But for some people, it happens out of nowhere and they don't have anything in place. And, and maybe that's you. And if that happens to be you and you're going through some dark stuff, I want to let you know, like, this is this is how it is for some of us, but it gets better. It's supposed to get better. It has to get better. It only makes sense that it would get better because the universe is investing a lot into you, into your initiation, into the next stages of your evolution. And the initiation, like any initiation, it's it's difficult, but you're going to get through it and it's going to be okay. And, um, you know, you can check out the other talks on my, on my channel, my podcast, where I have some some supporting principles that... I kind of developed along the way and there are things that I wish that I would have heard when I was going through this difficult stuff and that's why I'm putting it out. I've also got some interviews with people that have gone through this process as well in their own way and so they talk about it in a different way than what I've talked about here today because it's different for everybody and that's a very important thing to understand as well. We're all unique, we're all different and the, the process looks different and for some it's it's very gentle actually and, and fortunately they don't actually go through intense darkness and stuff. It's just very gentle. They don't even realize they're going through anything you know significant per se. They just it's very gradual and gentle and they just find themselves eventually one day uh, living in a new way and and you know they may not be able to pinpoint any of the significant events along the way but you know those aren't the people that my work is necessarily targeting. It's targeting the people that are, you know, going through difficulty. And so that's where this all comes from. Like when I'm sharing this stuff, I'm really sharing it because I want to support other people that are going through the difficulty in the way that I went through, that are going through the darkness. And that's what I really mean to say, like through, you're going to go through it to the other side where there's light. And what I'm sharing here on my channel, my work it's, it's really coming from that place. I am supported because, like I said, that's the mission that I've been called to do. So I'm supported and encouraged by, by the divine, by my guides, by my kundalini, my intuition, higher self, whatever you want to call it. It's all supporting me to do this work. But it's really coming from that place. Like I'm really genuinely here to just let people know that it's going to be okay in the same way that the teachers that supported me along the way were able to let me know that it's going to be okay. So before I wrap here, but I just want to remind you, you know, there's things that I've glossed over in this telling of the story there's some incredible things that i've left out incredible encounters with with um with different teachers and people and and, and friends that I, I that were going through this process there was like you know a lot of um uh incredible miracles and magic and and there was like mystical encounters and 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 you know maybe like you know cities and, and psychic powers and all this kind of cool stuff was also happening too okay so i don't want to scare anybody or deter anybody from exploring this after listening to me and thinking, oh my gosh, this is too scary. I can't deal with it. No, there was a lot of incredible things too. 
because this is a, a purification process, an evolutionary process that is the most incredible thing that a human ever could go through. And so in another time, maybe I'll talk a little bit more about the more, uh, you know, love and light aspects of the journey, some of the more miraculous stuff, and maybe I will gloss over some of the darkness. But today, I appreciate you for sitting with me and holding space for me as I share some of the, the things that I've gone through, the dark stuff. I don't, you don't have to worry about me if you're thinking, oh my gosh, this guy's he's been through some dark stuff. I'm good. I'm good. So uh, I, I really appreciate all of the support so far for this work. You know, uh, the podcast, the channel, everybody that comments, sends me a message, sends me an email, shares the work. It really, really means a lot. So I thank you so much. Please leave a comment below if you have any questions about this. Send me an email. If you have any questions, if you'd like to support me in this work, if you'd like to make a donation, you can. You can also find out how to meet with me one-on-one. -on -one. All of that is so, so appreciated. And you can find all of that at brentspirit.com. Until next time, much love and peace.